Fairbank Center is very lucky to have the technical assistance of uh, Nick Drake and uh, Mark Grady. Uh, we have very good staff and uh, they've helped us adapt to uh, work on Zoom. And so they're the technical people who, who really make this possible uh, for us to go about our business. So I'll wait uh, just another minute or so. Uh, Fairbank Center is still a great place with uh, many people who now zoom in and talk in. Uh, and uh, our job is to sort of keep up our work and keep up intellectual vitality, um, despite all the problems we have between our two countries and despite all the problems we have with the uh, coronavirus issue. And uh, we don't know when we'll start seeing each other in person, but in the meantime, we're determined to do everything we can to keep up the academic vitality uh, of uh, our, our uh, community and to keep learning, keep studying, uh, and not to give in, and to do what we can to help promote better understanding between China uh, and the United States. Um, Nick, do you think it's time to start? Should we not wait another minute? Um, we're looking, we're holding at about 80 right now. Um, so I, we can probably get started. I think we'll, uh, we'll we, probably we have get about 80. Looks we like have, about, well, we have 80 already. Yeah, we, 83 is the current number. Okay, well, maybe I'll wait just one or two more minutes before okay. we get started. Uh, so that's far, that's more than we used to have when we had audiences in Cambridge. That's true. Very true. Okay, well now I want to welcome all of you, uh, 83 or even more, uh, who are here to hear our session on critical issues confronting China. Uh, we started the uh, Zoom series uh, uh, two weeks ago. This is the third in our series. And uh, the bad news, of course, is that we can't assemble here in Cambridge. The good news is that by using Zoom, we can reach an audience outside of Cambridge and people uh, anywhere uh, can tune into our session. So that enables us to have, uh, we, we expect probably to be close to 100 before we finish. Um, uh, let me introduce the speaker first and then I'll turn it over to Nick to tell how, how we handle the question period. Uh, our speaker, uh, Carla Freeman, uh, is a graduate of Yale and then went on to SICE for her PhD, spent a few years uh, in Wisconsin, uh, where her husband and his family are uh, in the architect uh, business. And uh, she uh, sort of works between Washington and Wisconsin. And uh, she is a director of the Foreign Policy Institute at SICE. Uh, as you know, SICE is a key place for training uh, originally foreign policy officials, and uh, they uh, remained at, uh, a think tank as well as a teaching institution, and they have remained in the center of activities uh, even in the new era. Uh, we try in our series to keep up education about China and to use research uh, to understand what's going on, to go beyond the emotions that many people have uh, and uh, to try to get a, a real understanding. And Carla has been working on many issues, but one of the issues is uh, how do we have a commons uh, in dealing with issues like space? And uh, I think for our series, this is a very key issue because the question is, how much does China, uh, how much are they prepared to take part in international governance uh, and in setting global standards? And so we feel very lucky that uh, Carla, who is still uh, teaching, still doing research, running uh, a Foreign Policy Institute at SICE, uh, is willing to take the time to be with us today. Uh, about six years ago, uh, she spent a year at Harvard, so uh, we know her and she knows us, and we're very glad to welcome her back. And without further ado, Carla, it's yours. Thanks for coming. 
Thank you so much, Ezra. I think um, I will let Nick, I can see he's, he's trying to talk about logistics, so let him do that first. Yeah, I, I, I will just jump in briefly um, and say that we will, if you've attended some of our previous virtual sessions, this will sound very familiar to you. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. Um, and the way to, to ask a question for that is to use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you want to be identified, please put your name and any institutional affiliation you might have on um, the question. Uh, if you don't, there is an anonymous question feature that you can use. Um, so please use that. Otherwise, I'll, I'll read off whatever name pops up. Um, we expect that we'll probably get more questions than can be answered um, in the time allotted. So our apologies in advance if we don't get to your question. We'll be kind of picking um, somewhat at random from the questions that come in. So if you have a question that pops up during the um, talk, please feel free to submit it or submit the questions during the question and answer period. Uh, the last thing I will say is that uh, you may want to switch your screen to speaker view because since I'll be popping in to ask the questions at the end, um, you'll have, if you, if you have it on the gallery view, you'll be able to see my icon up there and it may be easier to see Carla if you just hit speaker view on your screen. Um, thank you all and I'll be back at the end. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Ezra, for inviting me and for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the Fairbanks Center staff, uh, Mark and Nick, as well. Um, by the way, uh, Ezra, I've been enjoying our, your latest book on China and Japan's difficult relationship. And, uh, uh, and, and I wish I could be as prolific as you. Uh, I, I also, I also want to thank uh, the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress. I'm actually uh, a fellow there, uh, the chair of the US-China program there this spring, although because of the uh, pandemic, I find myself uh, unable to be in my lovely office at the Library of Congress this spring, but I want to thank them for hosting me there and, and for funding my research, some of which I'm, I'm going to share with you today. Uh, and I also want to say quick, a quick hello to my cousin, Rip Freeman, who is uh, joining our program today. Thank you, Rip, for, for attending. Um, anyway, I've been working on this topic of how China is changing the global commons and how China's growing role in the global, global commons may be changing China for a little while. But my work is still very much a work in progress. And you're getting my first truly public talk on the topic. So I'm, I'm honored uh, to do this at the Fairbank Center and to have such a distinguished audience. And I'm very much looking forward to your questions. Um, as were mentioned, I was at the Fairbank Center about six or seven years ago. And that's when I first started my research on this. Uh, it was my last sabbatical. And I've continued to, to write, I published a couple of articles on the topic. Uh, and I think it's a, it, even though uh, six or seven years have gone by since I first uh, started working on my research, I think the issue is more important than ever. Uh, it's, it seems more important than ever to understand uh, this, how China is interacting with the global commons or what I sometimes call uh, the Earth's final frontiers, because we're on the edge of a really dramatic shift toward a much, much bigger presence by China in these global commons with all sorts of possible ramifications, uh, some of which I'll comment on today. Uh, one recent marker, for example, of China's uh, growing presence is the announcement just a couple of days ago on the 50th anniversary of China's first successful satellite launch uh, by Beijing, that it's 10 one one or Ask the Heavens One uh, Mars mission is going to proceed uh, in July 2020. Um, before moving, let me say that I know that talking about China and the global commons sounds kind of far out. Um, the global commons is not a particularly uh, mainstream kind of term. And then the words final frontiers may be worse. Have a, have, they have sort of a sci-fi, Star Trek-y kind of flavor. But one does hear about the global commons from strategic thinkers and military planners who think about flows of, of power. Uh, in the early 2000s, Barry Posen uh, published an influential article in international security titled Command of the Commons, the Military Foundations of US Hegemony. And the 2010 uh, Quadrennial Defense Review, uh, the United States Defense Review, referenced the need to quote unquote, 
assure access to the commons as, quote, the connect connective tissue of the international system as a key goal of US military strategy. And this, the global commons is also a term that's used by the United Nations to refer to these spaces. Again, these are all spaces that exist beyond the sovereign, sovereign control of national governments. So I'm gonna use the term global commons today and also in my writing based on those precedents and basically for want of a better label for those parts of our planet outside national sovereignty, uh, these, the physical manifestations of these, these, these uh, spaces, you could include cyberspace, for example, which isn't a physical space. They include the high seas, the seabed, uh, the atmosphere, Antarctica, and sometimes people include the central Arctic ocean and of course, outer space. Uh, before I, I, I turn to my uh, remarks, I, I should note that China itself does not use the term uh, global commons in its official documents, but a number of its scholars do write about the global commons and, commons and their relevance to China's rise in power. Uh, before I get to China and the global commons, it's worth thinking about why these global commons even exist. Global commons themselves are a rare phenomenon in the world. Much of their history has been, is the story of their enclosure. Uh, yet we have these vast planetary spaces that, that remain outside sovereign, sovereign control or what some people call, um, they are unterritorialized. Uh, there are several reasons that uh, the global commons still exist. Uh, now, to, to name a few of them, first of all, they are vast. They're vast and they're uninhabited. The high seas are over or uninhabitable. The high seas are over two thirds of our world's oceans. Antarctica, for example, is about 10% of the Earth's land area. Low Earth orbit, which is the region of space nearest the Earth, about, which begins about 60 kilometers um, above sea level and then extends another 2,000 kilometers. And that's just low, low Earth orbit, or orbit. These are vast spaces. And the fact is that humans are not adapted to living in them. And so it makes controlling them very difficult. And that this gets to another reason why these spaces have remained outside the sovereign control of, 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 of states. It takes a certain level of technology and organization to be able to use them and to access them and controlling them is even more difficult because it's difficult for states to establish and then defend borders in these global commons, at least historically. And that isn't for want of trying. Uh, today, states' territorial waters, uh, 12 nautical miles, are four times what they were just about half a century ago. And states continue to have outstanding territorial claims to Antarctica despite uh, the treaty that was signed in 1959 to make it a, a global commons. And there are also contingents around the world who have designs on outer space, asteroids, for example, as well as the moon. Just a couple of weeks ago, for example, uh, President Trump um, building off a law that was actually signed by President Obama to legalize the sale and ownership of extracted resources uh, from celestial bodies. Uh, he signed, Trump signed an executive order, order that recognizes the rights of private interest to claim resources in space. So things are changing very rapidly. Another reason we still have a global commons in the high seas is uh, thanks to international law, which, which Ezra mentioned. Uh, most notably, uh, famously, the persuasive arguments and the backing that Hugo Grotius had. Hugo Grotius was a lawyer who in 1609 made a very powerful case known as uh, Mare Liberum or the Free Seas uh, to resolve a dispute uh, between the Dutch and, and, the, and Dutch, Holland's rivals, Portugal and Spain, over uh, whether trade routes should remain open to all on the high seas. Portugal and Spain had claimed exclusive rights to these maritime routes for trade and their links to their, 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 their colonies in Asia. And uh, their claims essentially followed an earlier precedent of European thalassocracies or seaborne born empires that exercised exclusive control over areas of the sea. Uh, for example, the Hanseatic League dominated the Baltic and then at, at the height of its power, Venice effectively controlled the entire Adriatic Sea. 
So working for the Dutch East India Company uh, and using uh, Roman legal precedent and, and other, other, other sources, Rhodius effectively uh, launched, a la launched an effective legal challenge to Portugal's and Spain's claims, arguing that there was a long history of viewing the seas as quote unquote common to all, since no one had ever actually controlled all of the seas. And therefore he argued that the right to freely sail the seas and engage in, in commerce across the seas and to exploit uh, its fisheries, the seas fisheries was part of quote unquote nature's plan, a natural right of man to share in a common benefit. And subsequent powers, uh, notably the British, uh, followed by the United States, have seen it in their interest to preserve the high seas and, um, and, and this custom of open access to the high seas waters using nimble but uh, powerful navies with strategically positioned ports and strategic partnerships. They've been able to project power and secure what uh, what um, Alfred Thayer Mann called the open highways of the sea for maritime commerce. Uh, territorial waters in the, in, until recently again were limited along coast to a distance defined by the so-called cannon shot rule. So that was just about, about three nautical miles. During the Cold War, uh, the Soviets had, were developing their own blue water navy under the leadership of Ad Admiral Gorshkov. And in, in Gorshkov's book, The Sea Power of the State, Gorshkov actually uses Marxist arguments to preserve the seas as a global commons. And in any case, uh, once Moscow actually had acquired a blue water navy and a global power projection capabilities, as well as a, as a fishing fleet capable of doing uh, uh, substantial fishing operations and also um, the capacity to do uh, extensive maritime research, Moscow also chose to support high seas freedoms and to endorse a strengthened legal regime that could better secure uh, maritime mobility uh, and to at least prevent the misuse of ocean resources by other states. And uh, so we see, uh, we see both the United States and, Mo and Moscow working together during the Cold War to uh, support an open access or global commons regime for the high seas. Uh, and together, if, during the Cold War, the two countries were also able to agree that uh, this idea that outer space should be a, a global commons and uh, that, uh, that there would be open skies for satellites uh, that could pass over, over different countries' territories because that would have significant benefits for mutual security in the age of nuclear weapons. And of course, the United States has developed incredible uh, military technologies merged with, uh, with, uh, with uh, civilian uh, uh, global technologies we all use every day and we're using right now to project tremendous uh, power of, of different types. Uh, and just in terms of its military power, its overseas conflicts are, 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 are really, uh, to a large extent, space-based wars. Uh, this is something that China took note of since the first and, and, and especially since the second Gulf, Gulf War. Uh, and, China, and the United States has, has uh, provided uh, global public goods to preserve the global commons by defending uh, the high seas from piracy uh, and, and by until recently, at least historically, supporting uh, negotiations for international treaties that preserve the global commons as universally accessible uh, spaces. Uh, of course, the United States has, has uh, in, through its foreign policy mechanism, supported these treaties, uh, but uh, once they get to Congress, they don't always get ratified. And so, uh, notably, the United States has not ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, and, and also, like all countries with manned space capabilities, it has not ra uh, ratified the Moon Treaty either. So in some cases, uh, the United States actually uh, uh, follows so-called customary law, but in fact uh, has not uh, actually ratified the uh, legal regimes that preserve these, these, uh, these global commons as open access spaces. So now to China. Uh, the topic of China and the global commons is interesting uh, for many reasons, including uh, because of China's impact on global governance. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's also interesting because it helps us uh, see how China's growing ability to access and exploit the global commons is reshaping them. 
the power dynamics within them, and again, their global governance, and then how uh, China's engagement in all of these different global co common spaces, it may be changing China itself. And, and that's something I find particularly interesting. Uh, I also find the whole topic interesting for a kind of higher level reason as well, as um, uh, in the early 1990s, uh, mid 1990s, John Agnew and Stuart Corbridge uh, wrote a book called Mastering Space, Hegemony, Territory, and in International Political Economy. And uh, they, were, uh, they were thinking about, uh, about geopolitics at a time of rapid political change. Uh, and they observed that uh, at, at that moment, when globalization was, uh, was, 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 a, was transforming uh, international relations around the world. Uh, they noted they noted their observation was that globalization and the and the technologies that that were fostering were helping to to speed up globalization uh, had made geopolitics very fluid and uh, Agnew and Corbridge uh, saw that uh, technology uh, as well as economic uh, power and other nation national capabilities uh, like like education had had were, were joining uh, conventional uh, geopolitical uh, attributes of power, as they put it, as sources of, of states' uh, abilities to pursue their national interests. And they saw this uh, as, a, as a part of the overall diffusion of national power uh, that uh, was part of globalization and was actually reducing uh, the role, uh, the geographical uh, primacy of the territorial state in the international system. And so what's interesting now is you've got emerging powers like China that are particularly fierce guardian, guardians of their national sovereignty and many emerging powers who are uh, coming to becoming important actors in the global commons have not settled their territorial borders. Uh, and, uh, and, and they are, they are fiercely defensive of their sovereignty. And so their rise may be giving the Westphalian system a uh, reprieve. And so, uh, and not to mention, uh, uh, what how you American policy in the direction of, of American politics in the world right now. Uh, so the mastery by China of capabilities to, to both access and use the global commons uh, may mark a, a, be part of another change, a, a new change in direction in global policy politics that does less to actually erode um, uh, notions of national power that are rooted in territorial sovereignty than really to re-describe sovereignty along global or planetary lines. And I'll try to come back to this idea in my discussion of governance of the commons, but think about uh, extending national property rights into space uh, and expanding the, and ter further territorializing uh, the high seas and so forth. Uh, I should note that, uh, that there is already excellent work on China's growing engagement with each of these uh, specific global commons as kind of discrete areas of interaction. Um, Anne-Marie Brady, for example, uh, published uh, a few years ago a really path-breaking book on China as a polar great power. Uh, and you also have people like jo Joan Johnson Fries at the Naval War College or Clay Maltz at the Naval Postgraduate School who've done um, pioneering work on China and space security and written on various aspects of this. And then there, there's been a huge amount of work by people uh, very familiar to this audience uh, like Peter, Peter Dutton uh, also at, at, uh, at, at the Naval War College. Uh, and Peter for a decade at least has been probing how, how China's uh, activities uh, in the maritime arena are are impacting uh, that that uh, that uh, global commons that global environment. What I'm doing is trying to look at the global commons as a single entity, uh, because for a number of reasons. One one is that they're naturally connected as part of the the Earth's systems that support human life, uh, but it's also because they tend to be linked domains uh, through technology. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so when powerful, technologically capable states use them, they tend to use, they tend to deploy technology that, that brings these commons together. And I'll, and I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. So looking at, but at the same time, then looking at each of the commons together, sort of side by side, to see uh, how China is interacting with each of them and then comparing them, uh, also uh, helps me see some of the common patterns, of course, and also 
reveals uh, some, some points where it's more difficult to generalize about China's behavior across these three different uh, global commons uh, arenas. So um, here's some, some, let me give you some background on, on China's interactions with the commons. And, and Ezra, just to let you know, I am watching the time uh, carefully and I'll, I, I'm, I'm going on a bit longer than I, I had planned, but I, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I wrap up no later than midway through our program so our audience has plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, so for some background, uh, Chinese interactions with the commons have, have expanded particularly rapidly in the past decade. But of course, China is building on decades of, of groundwork that it, it laid. Um, you know, it's hard to believe that when, uh, when uh, the PRC uh, took power that uh, it, it inherited uh, a navy that was, was a river eye navy, very poorly equipped. Uh, but within uh, just a few years, by the uh, late 1950s, China had already begun a nuclear submarine and ballistic, ballistic missile program. It was quite extraordinary. Uh, in 1970, China had a per capita income of $120 or so, uh, and that was the year it launched its satellite into space. Uh, it sent a Taikonaut into space in 2003. Uh, and, uh, its Ant Antarctic program uh, began with Deng Xiaoping. With the, when China launched its reforms in 1978, Deng, of course, made science at, and technology a, a, maybe the, the most fundamental pillar of his four modernizations. Uh, and uh, China almost immediately sent scientists to the uh, to to Antarctica to uh, visit uh, a research station and set up a committee to study Antarctica. Uh, and had, by 1985 had already set up an Antarctic uh, station uh, and uh, was engaging in projects uh, both to scientific and some with uh, military implications. Um, but the most dramatic developments have really taken, um, taken off uh, since Xi Jinping uh, came to power. Uh, and these can all be seen as activities that are sort of part and parcel of the break uh, uh, from the Taoguang Yanghui uh, 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 approach to foreign policy to, to Xi's more assertive Yosuo Zouwei approach to international affairs. Um, since 2012, uh, China, the Chinese leaders have, have uh, put a lot of folk, given a lot of attention to these different arenas. And in, in 2015, um, began talking about them, these spaces, as new strategic frontiers in which China has, they haven't used the term uh, core, but uh, significant national interests. And in, in 2015, uh, included in China's new national security law, uh, China in, uh, created a domestic legal basis, um, the domestic legal basis for it to uh, enlarge its activities in all of these spaces, the polar regions, outer space, and especially the seabed uh, areas. Um, one of the um, members of the Legislative Affairs Commission of, of the NPC commented on the law while it was being drafted and was quoted in the China Daily, I think it was. Uh, she observed that, uh, I think she observed that China's exploration and development of these new frontiers was, quote, conducive to the common interests of mankind but also that China had the right to safeguard its activities, its assets, as well as its personnel within them. Uh, and China has since then produced extensive white papers on all of these different domains. It had a new, it published a new white paper on outer space in 2016. And for those not familiar, these white papers uh, uh, offer policy guidance. They, they, they get, they, they lay out a, an approach and set some uh, targets for, uh, for the, uh, the, the Chinese uh, government. China published a new white paper on outer space in 2016, a paper on Antarctica in 2017, and then a, uh, a white paper on uh, the Arctic in 20, 2018. Uh, and these are some of, the, some of these are the very first white papers on these frontiers, but, um, the, but uh, China had previously issued a white paper on outer space. And 
just using that particular white paper paper as an example, you can see how uh, you can see a sh the shift in, in tone and direction uh, from the earlier white 2011 white paper to the 2016 white paper. In 2016, uh, outlining China's uh, space policy, uh, the, the paper states that the primary purpose of China's program is, quote, the realization of the Chinese dream of renewal of the Chinese nation and to make positive contributions to human civilization and progress. Uh, and that kind of positions China as a global leader in outer space. The previous, the 2011 white paper suggested that the primary said that the primary purpose of China's space power objectives were to quote protect China's national rights and interests and build up its comprehensive national strength, national comprehensive strength. So very different kind of uh, tone. And of course, these state council policy documents have been accompanied by an increase in activities in all of these domains. Some have. Um, Perhaps you could argue that some have been accelerated because they've been linked to uh, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, for example. So now there is a polar silk road for uh, it linked to the BR as part of the BRI, as well as a space silk road. Uh, and in the case of the latter, uh, one form that the space silk road is taking is encouraging uh, Belt and Road participants to connect to China's uh, indigenous global positioning system known as Beidou. Uh, some analysts from countries who are skeptical of China's intentions uh, see a lot of these activities as, as, as aimed uh, not, not to uh, you know, ac uh, expand China's access to resources or to engage in scientific research, but as fundamentally aimed at shifting the strategic ba balance. And to give one possible example, uh, there are concerns that, the, that uh, China has set up a number of, of uh, of ground stations for Beidou, its satellite, its uh, global positioning system in Antarctica, uh, and these um, these these stations expand the capabilities, or among other things, that help expand the capabilities of Beidou uh, to give China's ballistic missile systems uh, over the over the horizon targeting capabilities, which some people see as uh, having si significant implications for the strategic balance in the Asia Pacific and, and, and perhaps uh, farther afield. So those are all some examples, but it's really China's gambit in the South China Sea that I think is the poster child for this whole story of China and the global commons and really the source of most international concerns about China's behavior. Uh, as I think I may have mentioned, China participated in and, and signed the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, uh, which most countries uh, agree defines the 200 nautical mile uh, exclusive economic zone that that treaty establishes uh, as part of the high seas. So countries are allowed to use, to, to they have jurisdiction over the resources in those uh, exclusive economic zones, but they do not uh, have, they cannot control uh, uh, vessels entering and leaving those waters. Those are high seas waters. So those high seas water, as high seas waters, the EEZ waters are freely open to transit by military as well as uh, to commercial uh, shipping. But China has sought to regulate access out by vessels within its EEZ on a number of occasion, occasions challenging uh, US and, and also Indian naval vessels rights uh, to access the EEZ without uh, prior notification. So that has been a big concern. In addition, uh, China refused to participate in the binding arbitration process brought by the Philippines under procedures that were laid out by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea to establish uh, the location of its EEZ, uh, and uh, which for the Philippines is incompatible with China's South China Sea claims. Uh, and that's a, a concern. And also China, in order to further establish its maritime claims, China has engaged in dredging and other construction, which has wreaked environmental havoc uh, as it constructed islands and built military infrastructure on top of some of the world's most diverse reefs in the South China Sea. And China has intimidated fishermen from neighboring countries with overlapping claims in what seems, uh, seems to be a bid to secure 
uh, important fisheries in the South China Sea. And there are also concerns that China is trying to uh, secure parts of the sea for its own uh, national oil companies, uh, which have moved, in, in some cases, truly massive uh, deep sea drilling rigs into the area. And in 2014, there was, of course, a huge uh, uh, deep sea drilling rig that was moved into waters that China and Vietnam contest. Uh, and, uh, and China referred to that risk rig as Chinese sovereign territory. So those have all, uh, all uh, those actions in the South China Sea uh, have uh, raised uh, alarms on a lot of different levels. But uh, uh, one of them is uh, that, that China's behavior uh, in the South China Sea is seen by many as a kind of potential encapsulation of what China's uh, role could be in the global commons writ large. And so there's concern that China might use its, its capability to engage in resource grabbing, whether it's fish or oil or minerals from Antarctica, the seabed, or even, even celestial features. Uh, and critics point to the fact that although China participates in international treaties governing most of the commons, the South China Sea case and, and other examples, for example, China's, China's participation in, in fisheries agreements. Um, I had a student do a, a dissertation on that uh, and uh, she studied China's behavior and said China sort of adheres to the terms and sort of doesn't. She described China's behavior as sort of playing the edge ball in ping pong, you know, just going sort of skimming the edge uh, of, of, of uh, compliance, but, uh, but also, uh, also not fully, not really complying. Um, on the other hand, uh, China's been doing really well meeting its nationally determined contributions to the Paris Agreement uh, uh, with respect to, to trying to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in, in the atmosphere, another global commons. Uh, so there are there are positive examples of, of, of China's behaviors, but there there are other concerns as well. Um, there are concerns, big concerns about the security implications of China's growing role. Um, concern that China will use its military muscle in other commons, like it did in the South China Sea, to intimidate the Philippines, for example, to to shift the global strategic balance. And people will point to the um, 2007 ASAT test which generated a whole bunch of debris, uh, for example, and, uh, or to Beidou, which, which is China's uh, global positioning system uh, that is far larger than the United States. It, has, uh, it already has, I think, 20 more satellites than, than the United States GPS, and, and that, that has, that's shifting the strategic balance. And, uh, and then and there's so many other, other concerns, of course. There's an industry of people in Washington working on these, but uh, also, there's there are signs of growing cooperation between China and Russia in these these arenas, and that raises concerns as well. Um, but it, to the but again, the the greatest internet immediate international concern is that China's is is relates to China's effort to extend effectively sovereign jurisdiction into the global commons by by changing the rules of the game. Uh, that apply to the EEZ, trying to regulate mil military vessels, and by doing that, violating this this long-held, you know, customary this long tradition of freedom of navigation in the high seas. Uh, and many people see this as uh, part of a long game by China to challenge uh, and change global norms and rules to essentially uh, territorialize the global commons, whether it's in Antarctica or outer space. Uh, space law protects uh, celestial bodies for national appropriation. But uh, as you, you could see with, with, the, the, with Trump's executive order that I mentioned earlier, it doesn't actually adjudicate ownership of resources that are, are extracted from celestial bodies. And, um, and there are some, there's, a, there's, a, there's some in China, for example, Ye Pei Jin, who's the head of uh, China's lunar exploration program, he has actually compared moon, the moon and Mars to the Senkakus and Spratly Islands uh, and warned that if you don't explore them and you don't essentially explore and sort of um, assert your ability, to, your ability to claim them, it might result in the usurpation of China's space rights and interests by others. Uh, so these kinds of comments raise a lot of questions about China's intentions. Uh, in other places like Antarctica, which will have a treaty review in 2048, uh, or how China might try to itself change uh, space law and so forth. 
So um, I'm wrapping up here. Let me just conclude with a couple of, of messy thoughts on how China's uh, technological reach into these global commons, uh, its planetary future uh, may be changing China itself. I mean, one way is that um, I, and if you go to a Chinese bookstore, you'll see a lot of kids' books that uh, talk about becoming an astronaut. That's a new thing. Uh, Chinese kids can now dream of being uh, taikonauts, which is quite remarkable. And of course, I also mentioned uh, the ways in which it's, it's, it's changing uh, China's domestic policy infrastructure, uh, lots of new policies. And, and uh, with that, I have been building out some organization charts associated with all of these uh, these new initiatives, and and so uh, you know you have a whole array of new uh, think tanks and other bodies involved in in planning and uh, and channeling resources to try to uh, expand uh, China's cap technological and other capabilities in these arenas. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly uh, how this may be reshaping uh, China specifically. But uh, one of the things that's really clear is that uh, like other great powers, uh, China sees these different global commons as interconnected frontier spaces that are really a laboratory for its further technological advancement that are literally going to de deliver a universe of new opportunities for, for China through, uh, the, through the pursuit of, of, of scientific and technological development. And you can read some of, of, about some of this, uh, this vision specifically in China's uh, SNT roadmap to 2050, I think came out a couple of years ago. So China's, in my, as I, I'm starting to, um, to think that China's reach into these, into these uh, frontier spaces, into the global commons, have become integral to China's embrace of technology as the engine of its, its, its future. And maybe it, they've, it's even part of a new dream of kind of perpetual, a perpetual technological revolution. Or um, I've been reading uh, Walter McDougall's amazing 1985 book on the space age. He calls it a saltation a saltation, a leap into, in the relationship of the state to the creation of new knowledge. The, I think what I, if the question is, um, will, China, uh, will China embrace this, this sort of technical, technological driven uh, future uh, by, um, uh, 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 by opening uh, its own technological development to international cooperation, a sort of maybe techno-globalism with Chinese characteristics, or will it become a, a techno-nationalism that will uh, harden lines between China and other countries in, in competition in the, in the global commons and maybe in, increase the impulse by China and other powers in response to expand uh, sovereignty or at least property rights into the global commons that will just uh, I think shift the balance between the um, in the global commons from uh, open access spaces uh, to uh, intense to zones of intense security competition, uh, which will uh, give uh, international rivalry truly uh, planetary uh, proportions. So I think I'll stop there and, and take some questions. Thank you, Ezra. <laughs> uh, Maybe I can start off with one question before I ask Nick how to explain for other questioners. <clears throat> uh, given the great tension between the United States and China now, do you think the uh, possibility of getting some agreements uh, about space are now impossible? Or if you were <clears throat> in a new administration in the United States and you wanted to work with China in a positive way, to try to keep uh, the commons a commons and not to get too territorialized uh, in Arctic and Antarctic particularly. Uh, it sounds like those are the, the areas where that, and, and, and beyond the South China Sea, so where China might be territorializing the common. <clears throat> Do you think <clears throat> it's now impossible to have some kind of cooperation in getting new international agreements, um, or if you were in charge of a new administration, uh, what would you do to try, and now that you've done such uh, amazing amount of work on all these issues, 
uh, what, what would your strategy in a new administration be for responding to China? Well, that's, that's a, an ambitious question. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and, it, and, it, and I really should be able to try to, 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 to answer it. But I, I think let me just uh, wander into it by starting with uh, the, the change from the, the uh, George W. Bush administration to the Obama administration. Uh, the, the, the George Bush administration had really uh, hardened lines on, on an intensified competition in the global commons and uh, had, uh, had, had policies that were designed to outcompete uh, other powers and a lot as directed toward China and Russia in these spaces. Uh, when, uh, when Obama came in uh, to office, uh, he uh, and his administration uh, focused much more on working with China uh, to strengthen uh, the, the legal regime around these global commons. And that was one area for cooperation. There's still parts of those agreements that the United States uh, itself doesn't want to ag agree to uh, because of its own concerns about, about, uh, about resource extraction. And that's one reason you know, because of our concerns about turning over our rights to uh, an international authority, our rights to exploit our seabed, we have never been able to uh, to ratify um, the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. But there, there is a lot of, of the a lot of work, is particularly in uh, around the outer space um, uh, regime, uh, for uh, China and the United States to engage together to strengthen uh, that regime. And there's obviously a pressure to be able to, now that we have the technology, emerging technologies to do this, to, uh, to um, exploit uh, uh, celestial resources. Uh, there needs to be a, a regime to govern that uh, so that we can do that in a way that isn't uh, disorganized. Also, I didn't mention it, but outer space is getting pretty crowded, surprisingly. There are just too many satellites. And we have a lot of private actors, not just um, on the US side, but internationally, including China, who are deploying uh, new types of satellite technologies. Uh, Elon Musk, for example, is, 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 is using sort of cluster satellites, these little tiny satellites. And that, that just clutters up space even more. And so we need regulations beyond uh, the ones that exist to, to uh, manage uh, some of that. Uh, so there's a lot of room for uh, discussion uh, between the United States and China. And uh, I think discussion that would be welcomed by the Europeans uh, who have their own space program, but also by other emerging powers, whether it's Turkey uh, or um, Saudi Arabia, other, others who would want to uh, uh, be able to regulate this environment because it enables them to make uh, better choices of, uh, about uh, about where to put their resources as they as they learn to, um, as they as they develop the technology to um, to access uh, the, these these various commons. So I, I think I would start at I mean obviously bilateral discussions are extremely imp important because we need. You know, we 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 aren't doing those, um, but having having uh, strengthening our mil military to military conversations, our our, our tech, tech our conversations uh, between the, the folks in government who work on science and technology, such an important part of the U.S. China relationship. All of those bilateral um, uh, facets of the relationship could be restarted, but we can also um, do that with international uh, law and global governance in mind. And there's a big demand in the international system for that. Um, in the United States, if it wants to continue to be seen as a country that contributes to global public goods, it really needs to be doing that. Um, we're not doing that right now. We need to get back to that. Thank you very much. Before I turn it over to everybody else, uh, she mentioned, uh, Carla, you mentioned Peter Dutton. If Peter Dutton is in the audience, Nick, could you let him ask the first question or make the first comment? And then we'll turn it over to everybody else. Is Peter Dutton in the audience? I haven't seen any questions come through from him. Um, but okay. if, if he sends in a question, I will uh, make sure to read it. Well, here he is. Here he is coming. Yeah. Hi, uh, Carla. Thanks very much for a great uh, presentation. Can, can you hear me? I can, I can. That's really terrific. Um, very kind of you to, uh, to mention those of us who are also working on this. Um, I, uh, 
I'm curious whether you've you've seen any. Uh, you've talked about some of the different shifts um, that that China has made over the last um, several years uh, in terms of their approach to strategy. And I'm wondering if you um, <clears throat> are are seeing um, the way that they're shifting uh, in in their approach to the maritime domain um, as their maritime power is growing. It seems as though they're becoming a bit more comfortable with more, uh, you know, with rules that allow for more open access uh, because it, it, it preferences now their own power. And I'm wondering if you're, you're seeing um, that sort of shift uh, in other domains. Yeah, so, so I, I, I haven't seen that in other domains, partly because we, we just aren't at the same point uh, in these other domains that we are uh, in, the, in, the, in the oceans. Uh, so it's, uh, but uh, I think uh, we we may uh, we may see uh, some um, we, we're seeing some signals and interest in uh, in strengthening uh, property rights in outer space uh, by China, uh, but that doesn't necessarily that won't necessarily be in. Uh, incompatible with an, with an open access regime. It just depends on their scope and uh, and how they are how they are designed. Um, I yeah I think you're suggesting that in in the in the high seas, uh, it's it we probably it, we may see China uh, sort of do what the the Soviets did once they had a, a blue water navy, uh, which is embrace uh, the ability to sail the the, the seas and, and we've already seen uh, China. In uh, in I, I think it's in in the U.S. territorial waters. In, was that in 2014? And it's sail, the Chinese vessels, uh, naval vessels, are sailing all around. Um, and uh, but whether uh, you know it, whether China will decide that uh, that those if if it, if the United States wants to have its its EEZs and territorial waters open to military vessels, that's the U.S. prerogative. But if China chooses not to, that's its prerogative. That might be a different way of interpreting. Uh, these these international regimes and uh, that would be interesting to see uh, that kind of uh, uh, approach applied to the interpretation of other other um, other regimes for the global commons but I really I am your student here so I'd really love to have your thoughts well um, mm -hmm. comment? yeah if you don't mind I'll just a quick comment um, it's very interesting to see that that China is doing two things at the same time. Um, in, in the maritime domain, they're they're uh, relaxing their approach to um, access for their own navy, but kind of doubling down on their own near seas claims to uh, to have prerogatives of control. So I don't know. It's a it's an interesting approach to uh, the commons, um, sort of defense at home and offense away, um, and and it's a, just kind of. My question was geared towards whether that sort of thing was uh, being observed in other domains. Yeah, I think I think we we um, it, we may we may see some of that in outer space, but um, soon, but but not not yet because right now uh, it's it's still you know China still hasn't been able to uh, exert that kind of control. But there are some things happening in orbital space. Uh, there people have all kinds of interesting uh, uh, notions about uh, about ideas of, of um, even choke points in outer space and things like that and it may be that we'll see some of this play out uh, where in, in orbital space sooner rather than later um, but something to watch thanks for a wonderful talk thanks thanks for Thank joining Nick back to you to end our questions okay um, so, uh, as I said, we are getting a lot of questions here. So uh, we will we'll try to get it to as many as we can. Um, Adam Hirsch says, in Governing the con Commons, Eleanor Ostrom writes about embedding conflicts in institutions with mutual ownership and peer monitoring and enforcement. How might this look given the current state of US-China relations and hegemonic rivalry? I think I'd have to I'd have to work on that one for a few days before I could answer answer that question. But I and, and so I'm going to I'm going to answer it really poorly, which is to say, I think uh, I think that the um, there there are the Ostrom Ostrom's thinking about the commons is something that is uh, well known in China. And uh, there are uh, Chinese thinkers who are um, who are who have advocated 
uh, some solutions to some of these uh, global commons, especially resource uh, challenges, uh, and, uh, and to, to, to draw on the lessons that she, uh, she, she uh, drew from her study of, 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 of global commons and how you can prevent the tragedy of the commons uh, in, in common spaces if they have appropriate um, regulations. And so uh, all I can say is that, that, I'm, that there is a, this is all fairly new, but there are some, uh, the, the, um, I've met at least two or three uh, young uh, Chinese uh, inter, uh, international legal experts who are, uh, or who have written about this and put forward some uh, proposals, whether they've, they, the, they've shared these in easily accessible articles, I don't know, but I've attended a number of roundtables where they've presented papers that, that talk about how Ostrom's ideas could be applied to some of the, the to even the, some of the challenges uh, that China has with its neighbors in the South China Sea. Thank you. Um, all right, so the next question we have is from, oh, I just lost. Don't hit spacebar when you have the question highlighted. Uh, okay, so China has a distinct legal tradition from, the, from that of the West, i.e. the US, the UK, Grotius. How has this influenced their conception of glo the global commons and how may it try to push against existing international laws and norms regarding these? And that's an anonymous question. Mm -hmm. So um, this is again a better question for people who are, are who are legal scholars than for me, but I have, have had to try to uh, get to this a little bit. And uh, right now, I'm actually working on understanding how uh, Marxist interpretations of international law may be uh, shaping uh, China's perspective on international law. Uh, but um, I, I don't feel like I I can be very articulate on 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 uh, on that uh, right now. But I. Uh, what, what, what is interesting is, uh, is China has uh, uh, increasingly elevated some of its own legal traditions uh, in, uh, in challenging interpretations of, of uh, UNCLOS, or at least interpretations of, of the, how, uh, legal, uh, how China's own legal rights in some of these, cons these commons uh, can, should be defended, for example, uh, uh, just uh, tradition and so forth. The, the in, UNCLOS doesn't allow uh, for um, historical rights. When you sign uh, when you sign the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, you 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 basically give up on on uh, on uh, you accept your, the, your EEZ, uh, but you give up uh, historical rights to, to uh, fisheries and so forth and so on. Uh, and uh, and it's interesting to hear. In Chinese legal systems uh, s circles, the argument that uh, that uh, that uh, China has its own legal traditions, and that that the the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is just is a Western legal tradition, and it draws on on a long Western tradition. And maybe we need to rethink uh, these legal traditions, uh, this legal approach to managing the global commons. So uh, it it it, it th this this discussion, although it's not official, is certainly out there um, in in the in the uh, in uh, legal circles in China and has been used um, in official statements. You can you can hear this in some official challenges uh, to uh, to uh, U.S. Um, uh, uh, to to international um, criticisms of, of China's uh, uh, actions in the South China Sea. Um, there was one other point. I think the other point that, that your question uh, raises, uh, reminds me uh, to make is that uh, in addition to a, a sort of China's legal traditions, there's also a whole other way of looking at the global commons as the commonwealth of mankind. Uh, and this is uh, in, in a view of the commons that, that developing countries in particular feel very strongly about. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that China has also supported historically. And this is the idea that, that uh, you need to preserve the commons so that when countries have the capabilities to access them and to use their resources, they will be available to them. And therefore the preser preservation is in part, pre preservation as global commons is in part uh, securing these resources as a at, for, for future use by developing countries. Of course, then you would need some kind of 
regulation, some sort of regime to distribute these resources. Uh, so that's that's a that's another uh, another sort of set of of, of, of ideas about the, the the role of the global commons and uh, that China has also been um, been uh, connected to uh, since uh, since uh, since the early, since the fifties. Really, and, and uh, since discussions on on uh, on some of these international regimes, whether it's it, that, that developing countries have been part of, in particular, the negotiation around the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Thank you. Um, next question comes from Michael Sutherland um, from the Congressional Research Service, and Michael says, "Does China's leadership see Russia as more of a long-term partner or more of a long-term competitor in the Arctic?" In, in the Arctic. Uh, so hello, Michael. Michael was one of my students, so it's nice to, to have a question from him. Uh, and he knows much more about Russia than I do, so I, I should put him on the spot and have him answer this question. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, I have not been looking at, at, uh, at the Arctic very much. I've been focusing on the Antarctic. Uh, and I've been looking just, I've just begun to look at uh, uh, China, Ru China, Russia cooperation, partly because it's, it, it, it's not a new thing. I mean, one of the reasons that China has been able to um, move so quickly uh, in developing technology uh, in out for its outer space program is that it, it after the Cold War basically uh, ended uh, Russia's space and, and Russia and Soviet Union collapsed, Russia's uh, space program, uh, which had been very robust, uh, Kind of fell apart, and and China was able to to acquire a lot of technology as a result because with with other military and other technology from Russia, uh, but now the the two countries are are cooperating uh, more, including in in uh, in uh, the the uh, internet in international legal uh, arena where they have uh, they have proposed uh, changes to. Uh, some uh, in international legal regimes governing uh, some of these commons uh, together. Um, and so I, I, I just would say, I think we're going to see um, uh, more cooperation. But remember, these two countries uh, have, um, are I, I still at, at, at heart, uh, are wary of each other. So we will see them uh, cooperate uh, against things like uh, and people against other countries like the United States and against issues, but uh, but when there isn't something to cooperate uh, on that uh, that isn't against something, I think we will see uh, much less uh, cooperation between the two. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Isaac Cardon at the U.S. Naval War College. He says, you noted that Chinese officials often cite PRC rights and interests in the high seas, outer space, cyberspace, et cetera. How do you understand the relationship between rights and interests? Do generally recognized rights under international law limit China's conception of its interests? Or do its interests dictate what China believes to be its rights? Or is there some other relationship? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Um, so I think, uh, again, I'm going to um, answer this poorly, but I would say that uh, China itself is not, those are, those concepts are still, uh, so there, those concepts are of rights and interests are still uh, uh, kind of empty boxes or still boxes that are, they're not uh, that are that have a lot of space for uh, left in them to 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 fill by China, and that it's still figuring out exactly what its rights are. I think it defends it. Defense of rights are absolutely part of its interests, and so the ability, the capacity to de to defend its rights, whatever they may China may, however China may define those rights, is in China's interests. And so um, I think uh, as as elsewhere. China is trying to uh, promote an, an international and, and now maybe planetary environment that is conducive to uh, its pursuit of the China dream to, to its rise. And so uh, its, its interests, I think it, that's an elastic concept. Uh, but, uh, and with that, I think how it defines its rights will change as well. Great. Um, this next question comes from Jason Chan from the Scott Polar Research Institute at the University of Cambridge. Um, Jason says, there have been many discussions in Europe and the UK on the growing pressures on the 
Arctic and Antarctic regime. Um, many are still observing China's pushing the buttons to experiment how different parties might react to their revisions as China is still an emergent power. However, I reckon a better gateway to understand their intentions might actually be to observe the global commons where there is a lack of existing legal regimes and institutions. It's especially the case that when China is trying to promote notions like cyber sovereignty in alignment with their domestic policies, um, and in fact, cyberspace may be the cornerstone of what you call techno-globalism with Chinese characteristics. From this point, I wonder if you think China's mimicking uh, is mimicking 20th century big science approach to global commons to establish legitimacy only then to establish new norms when it is ready for vital domains. Well, this is the big debate. Um, is, uh, is China using uh, sort of a, a incremental uh, behaviors uh, uh, to sort of a series of tactics to, uh, to change, change facts on the ground and then move to change uh, international laws or uh, I think it was um, it was it was Samuel Kim who who talked about how uh, the sort of the mini maxi, maxi principle that uh, China uh, su subscribes to uh, international agreements uh, to um, uh, but to maximize its its rights uh, but to minimize its obligations uh, and uh, and so once it uh, once it, uh, it, it and, and to use those as, as a way of sort of stable, use those and be part of those to help, uh, help provide it with a kind of set of stable uh, relationships uh, that it can then uh, use to uh, opportunistically uh, to, uh, to uh, grow its power or, 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 or uh, pursue other interests. And then once it has uh, more capabilities, it has the capabilities to change uh, the regimes uh, and to change the international environment that may require changes to those regimes that it will do that. We're just, we're, we're, this is a, these are open questions, they're really important questions. Uh, we're, we are, um, I think in, in, it's very, uh, it's very difficult because there is so much ambiguity uh, surrounding uh, all of these questions. Uh, it's, there are some, I think, in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S. security establishment who ha who already know the answer to these questions. They believe they know the answer to these questions. I, I am I am not as sure. But what I, what I will say is, it's absolutely clear that China is going as it sees itself as a great power, uh, that it, it that it has in, uh, rising capabilities, that it is a a peer competitor in some arenas with the United States. Uh, that it is frustrated with U.S. behavior in the international system and sees the United States as a, a destabilizing power these days. Uh, and so China is, uh, is already uh, establishing, um, uh, uh, finding what you might call exit strategies from the current uh, international regime by setting up its own international organizations, um, whether it's the AIB or or this uh, SCO or other um, or or even it has its own uh, own space organization in 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 Asia uh, that has a, a mem membership that mostly uh, doesn't have space capabilities, but uh, but it's 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 doing these things. Uh, I think as much as as a sort of insurance policy, even though the current system in many ways works really well for China, uh, the fact is that it's dominated by the United States, uh, and China would like to be able to uh, to appeal to uh, other countries uh, uh, and and establish um, its own it, it establish international regimes that uh, that suit its objectives better and maybe those of other countries, especially emerging powers. I think that's a, that is something we, 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 we can say is, is true because there are, there are some examples of that already happening. Um, we haven't yet seen China propose an alternative to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but there are a number of scholars who have suggested that you need something new. Uh, for example, um, one scholar proposed, uh, I think, I've forgotten his, his name, although he's very famous, um, uh, so I, I'm, I'm embarrassed. But anyway, he proposed that China have a marine cooperation organization like this, the SCO, 
to govern maritime uh, relations, maritime, uh, maritime uh, cooperation organization to get, govern maritime relations, particularly focused on the region, but one could imagine something like that um, on a global scale. So this is, these are, the, Ch the Chinese are thinking about this. They have, um, uh, they've given themselves some exits and some op opportunities for, um, for uh, leadership in, in different organizations, new organizations around the world. And we may see them set up parallel uh, regimes or pursue the development of parallel regimes to those that we that are established uh, uh, to govern some of the, the global commons. The thing is that so far, China has been strongly supportive of the United Nations. And so as long as these regimes have legitimacy in the United Nations, it's more likely to try to modify them uh, than uh, to, uh, to throw them out uh, entirely uh, if, it, if it had the capacity to do that. Thank you. Um, we may have time for, I think, about one more question here. Um, just before we jump into that, um, I've been asked by our director, Michael Sony, who's in the uh, audience, uh, to remind everyone that we have many events going on, and, and there's one directly after this. Um, Scott Kennedy will be speaking, so please uh, feel free to join us after that if you're enjoying this session. Um, and without further ado, on to our last question, which is from Rahul Pandi from the Jawa Real Nehru Institute or University of New, in New Delhi, India. I'm sorry for my pronunciation there. Um, what are the foreign policy and the PLA related components in growing China's engagement in these global commons? Well, that is a so so that is a huge question, and that's sort of the part of the book that I'm writing here. And so I hope I'll be able to to uh, to elucidate uh, some of that better, but. I mean, I think uh, I think one, uh, rather than sort of tackle, try to tackle it and, and think out loud as I just did in the, with the previous question, I just say I think one of the one of the things that the new developments under Xi Jinping that has uh, made that question particularly important is that we have uh, uh, civil military fusion. This policy of civil military fusion. It's really unclear what it means exactly in the Chinese context, but what it what it what it does. Uh, mean is that that technology there's a recognition that technologies uh, in especially as they apply to these uh, technological frontiers are more often than not dual use and so uh, it also gives China an opportunity the Chinese government an opportunity as the U United States government has had an opportunity to tap innovations that um, uh, emerge from uh, private private firms uh, and also to make available more resources to these uh, private uh, firms who were working on um, on uh, 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 new technologies that that uh, broaden China's access to all of these different global commons. So uh, I think I think it, it's it's you're seeing a, a set of new um, funding channels, new research and development. Uh, 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 think tanks, uh, new think tanks, and a whole new array of institutions to support uh, research and development around these, uh, these global commons or these, these frontiers. Uh, and, uh, and, and those will, those, uh, the technologies and the research that emerges from, from those will have both uh, civilian and uh, both, they may have both civilian and military application. Carla, I want to thank you for coming with us today. It's uh, very clear that you've done an extraordinary amount of research and thinking and how complicated these issues are uh, and how many borderline issues there are between what's in common and what has been decided by international rules and what still uh, allows room for individual <coughs> uh, efforts to uh, uh, improve their own situation and uh, raises just a lot of these basic questions. And so we're very appreciative of you taking the time and we look forward to your new research uh, publication. Thank, thank you very much, Carla. Thank you very much, Ezra. Thank you. Thank you for the thank great you. questions. It's a reminder, reminder that this, that I am audacious in trying to take on this topic, <laughs> but I, I appreciate them and uh, I will follow up in my research. Thank you. Well, I think we're, we're fortunate in having a wonderful audience and a lot of very bright people with a lot of good questions. And 
uh, we're glad we challenge you to stretch what you're thinking about all these important issues. Thank you, Carla. Bye-bye.